is, in old Athens, a bookshop. It is the loveliest one I know. I discovered it ten years ago, and within it, I found something wonderful. There, on a shelf, was a series of volumes, the collected, translated works of Aristotle. Impressive, certainly, but I wasn't much interested. Philosophers and poets and playwrights may all worship at the shrine of Aristotle, but not scientists. And then I opened one. The book was called Historia Animalium, The Natural History of Animals. It told of snakes and sharks and sea urchins, how they are built, where they live, and what they do there. Assertion followed assertion, fact followed fact like hammer blows. It was long, it was dense, it was impenetrable. And yet, it was magnificent. Aristotle, the man who gave us logic, poetics, political philosophy, had also known, loved, and sought to understand the natural world. Working by a lagoon on a Greek island, he investigated, analyzed, and documented the world of animals and plants, and did so in a wholly new way. There he discovered order in the chaos of organic diversity, and there he invented a science. And though it was my science, biology, I did not know it. But then hardly anyone does. For Aristotle's biology, strange, difficult, and yet wondrous, is almost completely forgotten. In the 10 years since I found that book in an Athens bookshop, I've been living with Aristotle, trying to understand the workings of his astonishing mind. What did he do? Why did he do it? And how? And most of all, why have we forgotten him, the first and perhaps the greatest biologist ever? The Scottish zoologist Darcy Thompson, who translated Historia Animalium, wrote that the lagoon where Aristotle worked was on the Aegean island of Lesbos. That same day, I boarded the evening ferry from Piraeus. It's 347 BC, and Aristotle is fed up. For 20 years, he has been at Plato's academy, first as a student, then as a teacher. But now, Plato is dead, and there's a vacancy at the top. Who should be the new head of the academy? Well, thinks Aristotle, obviously it should be me. Intellectually voracious, in the philosophical hothouse, he's the best. Plato calls him the reader. And he's original, perhaps excessively so. In the event, the job goes to Plato's nephew. Very well, thinks Aristotle. I'll pack my bags and go where I'm appreciated. And off he goes, east, across the Aegean. In the years that I've been searching for Aristotle, I've come to know and love this island. My dearest friend here is Yorgos Kokoros, an ecologist at the University of the Aegean Mytilene. It was he who first took me to the lagoon. And it is he who takes me there now. It was on the shores of this calm lagoon that 23 centuries ago, Aristotle did so much of his groundbreaking biology. He knew it as Pyrrha. Today they call it Calonie. But for me, it is 
Aristotle's lagoon. Lesbos is the perfect place for a naturalist. In no other Greek island is the natural world so endlessly present and richly seductive. On the frontier of Europe and Asia, Lesbos draws its creatures from both. In spring and autumn, it is a resting place for millions of birds migrating between Africa and the north. What do we see over there? I mean, there are avocets. There are avocets. Phileos Acreotis, Greece's leading ornithologist, lives on the island. He takes me for an Aristotelian walk in the marshes and woods that flank the lagoon. For me, science is an endless conversation about the world. Was it so for Aristotle? He came here to Lesbos at the invitation of a friend, Theophrastus. At least that's what many scholars believe. Yeah. But who exactly was Theophrastus and what did he do? He was a botanist, I gather. Theophrastus was a, um, a botanist. Uh, he was uh, another very special uh, person uh, of those times who has uh, given us written descriptions of um, a very big variety of plants. Um, actually, many of the plants of uh, today are named after Theophrastus, have their scientific names based on, uh, on his name. Um, quite, uh, uh, quite a remarkable uh, person. One imagines the two men, friends, dividing up the natural world. I'll do the animals, says Aristotle. You, Theophrastus, do the plants. And so, zoology and botany were born. Aristotle describes the forms, habits and habitats of hundreds of animals. He says that tortoises have shells, hiss, lay eggs and hibernate. That snakes copulate by entwining themselves. He describes the life cycle of the cicada. He tells of a bird with steel blue plumage, a long and slender beak, short legs that lives on rocks, obviously a rock nuthatch. Flamingos you can see over there. He turns his attention to the water's edge. In the shallows, he says, the vegetation is more delicate and lush than any garden. There is a kind of crab that has flattened hind limbs with which it swims. He says that ibises, herons and egrets use their beaks as fishing spears. And that stilts are very quarrelsome and do not have a hind toe. And he describes the loveliest of the spring migrants, the European bee-eater. Aristotle notes the voracious appetite for bees, how they nest in holes that they dig in riverbanks, and how they breed. And so each year, by the lagoon, the bee-eaters still do. This is the philosopher discovering nature. And he was not prejudiced by anything. He was not influenced by somebody who wrote about the same thing some time ago uh, and had read about it when he was young. Yes, a freshness. That, that, uh, that's what I admire in his writing. Um, everything he writes seems to be his own observations. In a wonderful passage known as The Invitation to Biology, he says, it's not good enough simply to study the stars, no matter how perfect and divine they may be. Rather, we must also study the humblest creatures, even if they seem repugnant to us. And that is because all animals have something of the good, something of the divine.
something of the beautiful. But make no mistake, Aristotle is no mere naturalist. He collects facts, lots of facts, and arranges them. He's systematic, relentlessly so. He classifies. In Historia Animalium alone, he names and distinguishes 110 kinds of animals. And he's especially good on fish. Oh, nice. What is this beautiful Melanus. thing? Melanus. 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 Tipurus. Tipurus. So right here we have about seven, eight, nine species of fish. And they're all the fish that Aristotle describes. And he does so in wonderful detail. He talks about their forms and their proportions, uh, where they live and, 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 and how they breed and how they come into the lagoon in and out every year. But Aristotle also notices that some species resemble each other. Aristotle classifies many of the creatures that he finds in the lagoon into larger groups. And you can see them here, such as these things, which I'm trying to get, which are sea squats. He puts sea squats, so-called because they squirt, and snails and sea urchins all in the same group, the ostracoderma, because they all have rather hard exteriors. He puts crabs, which also have hard exteriors, into a different group because they have legs. It's the beginning of the great classifications that we know today. Not all of his classifications have stood the test of time. Sea squirts, snails, and sea urchins are, in fact, quite unrelated to each other. But the 19th century discovered that. And he's superb on dolphins. Aristotle notices that although dolphins live in the water and look a bit like fish, they breathe air and suckle their young just as many land quadrupeds do. He therefore puts whales and dolphins, cetaceans, in a group of their own. His successors ignored him and just called them fish. What makes the scientist turn to the study of the natural world? So often, it is a place. And whatever that place is, it stays with him for the rest of his life. For it is where he first sees the beauty and delight of living things, begins to understand their mysterious order and glorious confusion. And it is where he first begins to wonder why. And that is Aristotle's question for he's in search of the deepest causes of things. And to do that, he knows that he can't simply go about pressing wild flowers and checklisting birds. He has to get into the guts of things. But to do that, Aristotle first had to find a friendly fisherman. Hey, Dimitri. Hi, Armando. Calimera. 